Awesome. Betty and Don, thank you so much. Good morning. That was pretty good. That was pretty good. Welcome to Bayview. My name is Rainey. Good to see everyone today. If you're joining us online, thank you so much for tuning in. Joining me here on stage. Uh, Andrew, one of the pastors. You sure about that? Okay. All right. He sounded a little unsure about it. Okay. This is Andrew. He's our family ministry. What? Family ministry teaching. teaching. There we go. So. There you go. There you go. What you got for us, Andrew? Great. And then the following Sunday, August the 21st, we have our Party on the Patio. We're, we might do an acronym for that, the POP. This is Michigan. We call it POP instead of soda. But this is basically our volunteer appreciation picnic. Um, we've got a, a local vendor that does barbecue that we had last year. It was so good. We're going to have them come back in. That'll be on the patio immediately, uh, not immediately following the service, but in the afternoon. Um, and this is for anyone who's volunteered in any capacity throughout the year. So if you sing on the stage, if you help with announcements, if you're a greeter, if you work on Wednesdays, you can show up that Sunday, help set up chairs and tables for the party on the patio, and you too are a volunteer, and you can stick around and eat. You laugh. We had people do it last year. It's a trick. That's how we get you in. So party on the patio on the 21st. And then on September the 4th, September the 4th, that's also a Sunday, we have our summer baptism. Now, some places they've got a built-in baptistry. We do right here under our feet. Uh, hopefully it's not a trap door. And then uh, in the wintertime, we set up a little hot tub over in, in the gym for the modern service. But in the summertime, hello, who has a better baptistry than us? Right across the street. So if you're interested in uh, baptism, sign up, grab a card, put your name on there, just write baptism. And speaking of cards, all of these events, including the baptism, our connection cards here, this is our Get Involved card. Grab one of these. Check off what you'd like to be involved in. Put your name on there. Put it in the return box. We'll get a hold of you. Now, if all of this is new to you, maybe you're visiting with us today. Thank you. Thank you. We have a card for you. It's called the I'm New card. Grab that. should be in the seat back in front of you. There's an icon if you're watching online. Fill out your information. And again, that goes in the drop box at the back of the sanctuary. Yeah, and there you also see a prayer card. Uh, and this card is really important to us as well, especially as a staff. Uh, if you have prayer requests, praises, uh, things of that nature, we would love um, for you to write those down. You can turn them in just because we spent some time praying for you. There's a group of ladies who, who pray over these. And so um, this is really important to us. And we just want to make sure you know that we care about you and we're thinking about you and we're praying for you as well. Uh, with that being said this morning, uh, we're just so glad you're here with us. I'm going to pray for us and we're going to continue our worship service. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for you. Thank you for a chance uh, just to come and, and worship you, God. Father, we're so excited for um, the opportunity to get together uh, as a body of Christ and just uh, sing songs and, and then hear a word. We pray you um, speak through Pastor Chris this morning. Uh, let it be a glorifying time to you. Father, we love you and we thank you. In your name, amen. From the book of John the first chapter beginning with the first verse. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it.
Heavenly Father, you have poured your love down upon us. Today, may we show that love to others. May we weep with those who weep, find joy with those who find joy, and speak to those who need to hear your word. Father, you are great and awesome. It is such a privilege to be in this house or viewing and worshiping you today. We ask, Lord, that you be with Pastor Chris as he brings the message. May our hearts and minds be open for what he has to share. We ask all of these things in the precious name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Good morning, Bayview. Welcome to church. I am Chris, another one of the pastors here. Good to have you here today. Uh, just glad you're with us. I just look forward to Sundays. I do. Uh, I'm glad this is one of those rare summers where uh, I have a lot of speaking events, but not a lot of them are on Sundays. I get to be here a lot, uh, which I, I just get up on Sunday mornings, and I can't wait to be here with everybody. So I hope you feel the same way, uh, and uh, just enjoy being with our church family. Um, one quick thing before we jump into uh, On the Water today, uh, you may remember that back in January, we launched something that for some of you particularly, uh, well, for all of us, it was really a new concept, a new idea. For some of you, you shared with me, it was an idea that, that you still weren't even sure how it worked, and we're learning along. We launched what we called our digital campus, and we recognized that coming out of COVID, that there was still a significant demographic of people that were going to just engage with us online. Uh, whether they were local, whether they were not local, whatever it may be, we knew that we'd continue to have uh, that happening. In fact, on any given Sunday, between our two services and all of our platforms, we have uh, between 175 and 250 people engaging with us uh, digitally and watching. And so every once in a while, we get to see those two worlds collide. And so I'm not going to make her stand up because I don't want to embarrass her and, 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 and wig her out. But this morning, uh, we have one of our digital campus attendees. She's actually visiting Trevor C. this week, and Megan is with us today. And uh, she is from Rhode Island, and uh, she is on, she, she's worshiping with us every single Sunday right here. Good to see you. I'm not going to make you stand up. So, you know, just look at your phone. Pretend you're still at home. So we just want to welcome Megan. How cool is that? How cool is that, that we have this opportunity? And so uh, I love reading all your comments. And, and I know that, you know, she connects a lot with Pastor Brock, and he's our digital campus pastor. And uh, just so good to have you here in person today. Uh, sorry, we're not, we're not as good looking in person, probably. Like the TV does a lot. So, my bad. Um, anyway, hey, we're doing this on the water series. We're looking at stories from the Bible that happen on water because it's summertime. And uh, I don't know about you, but it's just good to be on the water, around water. Uh, yesterday, I spent all day yesterday uh, 
with water. It was awesome. I power washed our house. And so I was soaked all day yesterday, but it was a good day for it. It felt really nice, like all that soap and water. Um, one of the common themes, though, as we do this, I and mean, we've seen some, some common themes. You see a lot of stories about storms and, and things. But another common theme that is throughout the Bible, particularly the New Testament, is this concept of fishing. Now, the reason for this, of course, is that Jesus, he would tailor his messages and his teaching to his audience. And he was teaching a lot to farmers, to carpenters, and to fishermen. And so we see this common thing happening. Now, I can be honest with you, I think I have been fishing in my lifetime a total of like maybe 10 times. Like, like, I think that that's the extent. Maybe a few more, but that's about how, how much I... I remember my very first time fishing, at least the first time I remember, was in Oklahoma. And I remember it because I was a, I was a child, and we were fishing on, in one of my uncle's catfish ponds, and I had nothing but a cane pole, and I must have hooked a, a, a whopper. Is that, is that the right fisherman term? A whopper? Is that, I, I'm not a fisherman. I don't want to use it improperly. It was such a great fish, and I was such a little scrawny child. It pulled me in the water. It, like, it's like, I don't know who caught who that day, but, uh, but, you know, so here's the deal. I've caught fish. I've been fishing, but how many times do I have to go fishing or how many fish do I have to catch before I can call myself a fisherman? Like, like, like where's that threshold of when I get to now adopt that, that label or that, or that, or that badge? Uh, I mean, do I have to go, you know, 20 times or catch 50? Here's the reality. I will never consider myself a fisherman. I, I could go fishing every week. I could make myself go out there and do it, and I could catch fish, whatever. I don't think I'll ever truly carry that label because it's not a passion of mine. It's not something I love to do. It's not something that, that, that my life is built around. I mean, you talk to a true fisherman. I mean, everything about their life is about when I went fishing last and when I get to go fishing again. You know, I mean, that's why I, I, I do call myself a golfer because golfing is one of those things I do. Like, like every, every day is like, I wonder how I could get like nine holes in today. You know, uh, yesterday was one of those days because we got up, we had all these plans of, of we're going to power wash the house and get this done, this done. But then there was something, uh, an emergency interruption. There was a 10 o'clock tea time <laughs> that I was invited to and it was free. So free golf is the best golf. And I told her, I was like, listen, we're stewards of God's money. I have to do this. <laughs> Financially, we cannot do it. I'll just never be a fisherman. It's not something I'm excited about. It's not a part of my life. This morning, we're going to look at a story. And what it's going to do is it's going to give us one of the most well-known phrases in the Bible. One of the things that we've talked about over and over again. But I think maybe we have a different angle to look at the story today. So if you have your Bibles, we're in Luke chapter 5. And we're going to be looking at this interaction. It's the section there. And it's interesting as each gospel has a section here that says the calling of the first disciples. Chronologically, there's a lot of different interactions. We're not going to dig into all that today. But we're going to start right here in Luke chapter 5. The first three verses say this. One day as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed on him to listen to the word of God. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push out into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. Now, we're going to pause right there. We're going to kind of chunk this story out. What's happening here is obviously the crowds are all pressing in. Jesus needs more space. And as crowds do, they want to get closer. And they're trying to hear the words of this teacher. And it's getting closer and closer. He's getting closer to the water. He gets in the boat. Now, many a sermon has been preached on this passage Many, many a pastor has stood on stage holding a fishing pole, myself included. Many outlines have been given on how we are called to fish for men. And all. I've done all that. I've done all that. But as I look at this story a little bit differently, getting ready for today, I begin to recognize something. This, for Jesus, this wasn't a fishing trip. Jesus didn't put a fish in the, pole, in, in the water. He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't put any lures in the water. What this was for Jesus, this was a recruiting trip. There was something completely different on his agenda, on what he was here to do today. And so what we have happening is this, is we conclude that Jesus had already had some interaction with these men. If we look at the chronological order of the, of the Gospels and try and piece it together, he had already invited them to follow at some level. They'd already had a level to get to know him and who he was, but now it's time for something different. Now it's time to up the ante. So we continue on. Verse 4 goes this way. 
When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, now go out where it's deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. Now, pause right there. How did we get to this point? What's happened at this point is this, is that while the, the, the men were over here cleaning their nets and kind of picking things up after a long night, Jesus asked if he could simply get in their boat and use their boat as a teaching platform. They were fine with this. This was an introduction to the convenient Jesus. Because this didn't really put them out at all. This was no big deal necessarily to them. I mean, I mean, it didn't stop them from, clearly what we read, it didn't stop them from cleaning their nets and get everything put away. Yeah, that's fine. Get in the boat. You can use my boat. That's fine. That's where a lot of people find their followership of Jesus right there. We are interested in a convenient Jesus. Yes, Jesus, you can come into my boat. You can do these things as long as it's not a huge disruption. As long as it's not a huge change or, or, or course-altering request from you, yes, you can. That's kind of where they're at until Jesus changes things, and he asks this. He says, okay, now we're done with this portion of our interaction. Now I need you to take those nets, the ones you just cleaned and put away. I need you to get all the other stuff. I, I, I'm sure there's a lot of other things other than just nets that had to go into the boat in order to go out and go fishing. All the stuff you just put away for the day, everything you just did, I need you to undo all of that, get it in the boat, and take me out to do what you just did all night. Now we are introduced to the inconvenient Jesus. Now we're introduced to a Jesus that is not okay just tiptoeing into our lives and, 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 and hanging out in the lobby to where it's not a big disruption. Now we're introduced to the fact that Jesus disrupts everything in our lives. The excuses were plentiful. If I'm, if I'm, if I'm any of these fishermen, I'm like, well, Jesus, listen, it's not just that we fished all night and caught nothing. Like, we just put it away. I mean, we literally, I mean, I, I, I know you all have kids. I have kids, and they're all home from college right now, and I'm a bit of a neat freak, and so I'll walk through our living room, and I'll fold all the blankets and put them in the, in the blanket basket, and I'll, I'll get all the, all the cup coasters, and I'll stack them up real nice, and I'll make sure everything's wiped off. I can literally walk to my room and come back out like a minute later, and it's like a tornado hit. <laughs> I just put this all away. What is happening in our home for these guys? Is that way? Like, we just did this. Jesus is not interested in being convenient to your life. Jesus is not interested in the tiptoeing in and not shuffling things up. That's not how he works. In fact, as we look at this, there's actually two interesting things about this convo. The first one is this, is that the, 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 the words from Jesus, this wasn't a question, it was a command. His words are, now go out to where it's deeper and let down your nets to catch a fish. He wasn't asking. He wasn't suggesting. In fact, if you look through the Bible, you look through so much of what Jesus does and how he interacts with people, very rarely does Jesus use words like, hey, uh, if you don't mind, could you? Or, or hey, uh, just, just when it works out for you, if you have a moment, maybe do this. Or, or here's a suggestion. That's not how Jesus works. And I know that we read through the Bible and we read and we read things that are commands. But you know what we do? We don't read them that way. So I have to ask myself. I have to ask us this question. And it's this one. Do we put question marks where exclamation marks belong? I think we do. If we didn't then I don't think we see some of the stats we see about how often people that have this incredible good news that know Jesus and know the life transformation and the fact that it gets all this guilt and shame off of my back and it gives me this new creation, this new relationship. If we truly believe the exclamation points instead of the question mark, I think we talk about it a lot more. But so many don't. It's because when we read things from Jesus like go into all the world and go do this and go do this, I think we, we miss the text and the tone. Second thing about this, it's about the words they use in their response. When Jesus gives them this command, it's interesting. Quickly, Simon says this. He says, master. 
Master, we've been fishing all night. Master, we just put our nets away. Master, now that word master is unique because in the context, in the original language, that is a huge term of respect. That is acknowledging that Jesus is something above them. He is some, he's a master. He is a teacher. He is their leader. This is why we recognize he's already had interaction with these men. At some point, they've recognized that this man is different. Now, I don't know that at this moment they realize he's the son of God. We certainly don't think that at this point they even had a grasp that he was going to be the Messiah. They had no clue what was going to portray and how it was all going to play out in the next three years. But we do know this. They recognized that there was something different about him. His words were different. His life was different. His purpose was different. And when he spoke to them, that was also different. And so the term master was a significant deal. Because he just asked a bunch of professional fishermen to go out there and do something they'd been doing all night that should really yield no different results. Everything in them, they had the expertise to clearly and articulately explain to Jesus why this request was ridiculous. Jesus, I I understand what you're asking, but here's why we know better. I've done it in my life. Oh, Jesus, I know what you're asking me, but you don't understand. Like, I've got a really great plan, and I've got it detailed. Here's why you need to listen to me instead. Here's why my way is better. Here's why my agenda is more important. Here's why. And here's the thing. They recognize something that maybe I need to recognize something. That you may be the professional, but he is the master. You may be the professional about your life. These were professional fishermen. They had all the professional reasons not to go fish, but that was trumped by one thing. They may be the pros, but he's the master. You may be the profession of your life, which means this. If you're a pro at something, you, you know everything there is to know about it. You know every detail. You know all the ins and outs. That may be where you feel like you're on your life. At some point in this following of Jesus, we've got to quit trying to explain to him why we know better and stop being the professional and submit and relent and completely give in because he's the master. He knows your life. He knows what's coming that you can't see. He knows what you've been through. He knows all the things from your past. He knows what's happening right now in your hearts, in your minds. He knows what we struggle with. He knows what we celebrate. He knows what makes us sad. He knows all the areas that he needs to get in there deeper. He knows all the spaces you're keeping him out of. Because he's the master. And they recognize this. Because they gently explained why they hadn't done it, but then they did it. So we move on, Chapter, verses 6 and 7. So they went out, they put their nets down, and at this time their nets were so full of fish, they begin to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in with the other boat, and soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. Tremendous catch. I mean, I mean it, it clearly is a catch of a lifetime. This was not normal. In fact, I would dare say that for these men, being professional fishermen, this was the payday they used to always dream about. This was the catch that they used to always like, how amazing. In fact, I would dare say this. I don't think there was probably ever a moment in all their wildest dreams that they sat around and thought, you know what? One day we're going to catch so many fish, it's going to sink our boat. That's not something most fishermen would ever think is a good thing anyway. They had just experienced something that wasn't just a miracle. It wasn't just something completely supernatural. They had experienced something. This was life-changing. The wealth of this catch would alter the direction of their life. They now would have money to maybe buy more boats. They now would now have money to provide for their family in a different way. They could now change their status potentially in the fishing society chain of command or whatever it may be. This was something amazing. Jesus knew, though, they had to choose. In fact, he calls them to choose. See, I, I, I think it's one thing for us to talk about all the, the, the evil that can come in and disrupt our relationship with Jesus Christ, and there's plenty of it. We, we spend time, we talk about, certainly we talk about the sins and the evil desires and the, and the things that we come in that interrupt this incredible intimacy that he desires to have with us. Those are all very real, but also it's not just the bad things. What about the good things? 
What about when you find yourself? It's one thing to be like, well, if I choose sin or God, it's one thing to be in that moment. But what happens when you come to that fork in the road and it's good versus God? How many of us struggle in that moment? Well, I'm not choosing something. I mean, clearly there was nothing sinful about this catch of fish. These weren't, these weren't evil fish. These weren't, these, weren't, these weren't devil fish. Jesus created this. This was, an, this was his miracle. And yet in the moment, he says, okay, listen, here is everything you could ever imagine happening. Here is wealth. Here is success. Here is, here is a blessing beyond measure. You have this, but now I've got something else for you. I need you to choose. Good versus me. Jesus recognized something very important. You can't fish for men and fish both. You can't do both. I, I, and, and, and I think some of us are tempted to say, well, no, I can, I can, I can. You, both may happen, but let me assure you that at the end of the day, you can only be about one thing. This last spring at our Man Up Men's Retreat, our speaker and friend of mine, Foster Christie, was just laying it out straight up for us. I love how he comes in. And he just talks to men like men should be talked to. In fact, I remember when I first got into itinerant speaking, I had someone, uh, a wiser, older speaker, give me this advice. Like, hey, when you speak to, to the ladies, understand that you got to treat women like, like they're crystal. You got to talk to them like they're crystal. But men, they're the old dirty thermos in the back of the truck. You just got to talk to them like men. And sometimes that's what needs to happen. And he was doing that. But he said something that was so profound. I just never heard it said this way before. He said, men, you think that every day you get up and you go to work and you go to your career, you get up every day and you do that to make money and to find success and to provide for your family. He goes, you're wrong. If you're a follower of Jesus, you get up every day and you go to work to be a change agent for the kingdom. You don't go to make money. You go to catch fish. You go, you go out there to catch men. You go out there to do something different. Now, you work hard. I mean, you may get both. You may have success. And, and, and God blesses careers. And he blesses things. And, and we're told in the Bible to work hard. But that's not why you go. That's not what you can be about. What Jesus is saying is like, listen, you can only be about one thing. You can be about your business or you can be about my business. And he calls them to choose. So we read this in verse 8. When Simon Peter realized what happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh Lord, please leave me. I'm such a sinful man, for I was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught, as were others with him. His partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. Jesus replied to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. As soon as they landed, they made their choice. I, I, we don't really have the rest of the story. I don't know what happened to, the, to all the fish. I don't know if they, if they just said, hey, here, here's the keys to the boat. I, I don't know. But what was very significant is now the change had happened. The change in what they were about shifted. Jesus' recruiting trip was successful. They weren't the most educated men. In fact, they were probably were pretty low on the, on the school totem pole. They didn't even know probably much about the scriptures. What he did know is this, is that they were willing. And we begin to see this change. So if, if, if you have this change, what does that look like? Well, what does it mean? Like, 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 what did they experience? Well, I think there's some tips that we can glean from this. Some, some things where we take the eye concept of fishing and why Jesus said those words. He, he knew what they were good at. He said, okay, now listen, I want you to take some of the same concepts and I want you to apply it to, to, to people. And, 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 and they translate very well. So the first one is this, that you can't catch fish in a barrel. All right? Now, I know the saying is, you know, I, I think one of the things is, well, you can't, you know, you shoot fish in a barrel. The whole concept is this, is that apparently shooting fish in a barrel is rather easy. Okay? I'm not a fisherman and I'm not a shooter either, so I would probably miss them. But, but the idea is that, that if you have all the fish in a barrel, like, it's, it's very easy. They're right there. They're contained. They can't release them. There's no, there's no work there. I think what Jesus is saying to them, I think what they begin to understand is this, is that we cannot just sit here and wait for the fish to jump in the boat. I've seen that happen. I've, I've seen the YouTube videos. 
you know, where people are driving down, and all of a sudden the fish jumps in the boat, and they all freak out, ah, you know, and whatever. That's not how this goes. I mean, yeah, it'd be so easy. Yes, I agree, it would be easy if we could just turn on the lights and make sure our sign is, is on and, and, and make sure that we put out there uh, that we're going to, you know, we have worship every Sunday at 9.30 and, or 9 and 10.30 a.m. Okay, we put it out there. All right, let's sit here and wait for them to come. That's not how it goes. That's not fishing. That's not going. If I could read this, Mark 16, 15, Jesus' words, and then he told them, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Now, here's the good news. You don't have to go that far. I mean, think about the people in your world. I mean, yeah, we take this and we do embrace this when he says go to all the world. So, yes, we go to the world and, 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 and Baby has a long, long, amazing history of supporting international missions and, and missionaries and sending teams out. And we'll continue to do that. But your world is also the world and your world is right here. Who's in your world that doesn't know Jesus? Coworkers? Neighbors? Friends? Family? Jesus is saying, like, listen, quit sitting in your barrel and waiting for the fish to jump in. You got to go. You got to go and you got to engage them where they are. But it also means this. Again, I'm not a big fisherman, but I believe this. You can't force the fish onto the hook. Like, you can't, you can't yell. I mean, the few times I've been fishing, somebody took me ice fishing several years ago. That was awful. It was awful. And it wasn't because it was cold. In fact, it was the opposite. I, I guess I thought, you know, my, my biggest connection to ice fishing, I think, was like cartoons watching. That. I thought we were literally going to be sitting out on the ice around a hole. And, and I was all bundled up. And I get there. We're like in this heated, like, ice shanty. In fact, I was hot. I was stripping clothing off. But, but, we, but we did. We sat around. We looked in this hole. And, and we were there like seven hours. Caught Nothing. Nothing. And there was, like, I was doing everything I could to will something. Because I thought maybe if we catch one, we can go home. <laughs> it wasn't happening. Like, like, but here's the deal. That's how fishing goes. There's something about fishing that requires this incredible patience. In fact, it, 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 when someone is gearing up to go fishing, I don't think that they're, they're in the mindset of like, well, I'll be back in just, in, in, you know, 15, 20 minutes. That's not the mindset of a fisherman. The mindset of a fisherman is like, hey, listen, we're going to go out there. We very well may be out here all day. And we're going to wait. And we hope we catch something, but there's a very real possibility, at least in my experience, we're going to catch nothing. And then we're going to get up the next morning, and we're probably going to go do it again. I think we get so determined that we got to force people on the hook. We got to get them to that point. In fact, I grew up you know, being around maybe, you know, situations where, where uh, I was at a church where they wanted to just go, you know, go door to door and, and knock on the door and be like, hey, if you died today, would you go to heaven? And, and go out to the mall and just engage people and, and get people to pray that prayer. That was always that goal. Pray the prayer, pray the prayer, pray the prayer. Okay, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm not, if you've done that, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm saying this, like, like what really happened there? Like, let's say you got a stranger to sit down with you on a park bench, and, and you spent about 10 minutes with them, and they prayed the prayer, and you're like, peace, sweet, you're out, got another one, check off the box, and you walk away, you never see that person again. That's the short game. Not saying Jesus doesn't respond, I'm not saying that Jesus doesn't come into your life, I'm not saying that, I am saying this, that Christians, followers of Jesus, to be true fishers of men, we've got to get really comfortable with the long game. We got to get comfortable spending time with individuals, hearing their stories, listening to their hurts and their wounds, spending time just, just maybe crying with them and, and laughing with them. We've got to spend time letting them watch us, watching our attitudes and our life, watching our, listening to our words and the way we interact with others around me. The long game is what fishing is all about. Nobody goes fishing for 10 minutes and calls it a day. There's something else that we've got to embrace we read this in 1 Corinthians 3. This is Paul writing, and he kind of lays the same groundwork. Verse 7 says, it's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is that God makes the seed grow. 
The one who plants and the one who waters work together with the same purpose, and both will be rewarded for their own hard work. What he's saying here is like, listen, you don't know where you are in the process of all of this. You may, at moments, and those times are so awesome, you may be in that moment where someone has been, you know, slowly listening to the Holy Spirit in their life and they're sensing something different and that they need this. You may get to be there when they're ready to truly make that, that surrender to Jesus. You may, but that's not always the case. You may be somewhere way early in the process. You may be that person that through an act of kindness exposes them to something, that, to, to something they're not familiar with. You may have a chance to walk and love them through something difficult to where all of a sudden they become aware that they need something, that, they, that there's a void in their life. You may be somewhere in that process. Whatever it is, is as the church, I think we need to quit being so focused on the short game. That's not the goal. In fact, I think the goal shifts when we look at this. All we can do is set the bait. Now, I, I don't know every word of the Bible. I mean, I read it a lot, but I'm sure there's people that know a lot more. I know there's people that know a lot more than me. I don't remember, though, a single time in here where I see uh, the Bible saying that it is our job to get people saved. If you know that verse, bring it to me. Like, that's not our job. Like, it's not even our ability. Our job is to get them to Jesus. Our job is to keep setting the bait with the way we love them, with the, with the, with the way that we, we show the, the salt and the light and that we're noticeably different because we have Jesus in our life. Which means if all we can do is set the bait, it also means this. You can't clean them until you catch them. Now, I, again, I'm not a fisherman. So maybe there's a method that I'm not aware of. But I've never seen a fish come up filleted and cleaned that's how I prefer them you know that's how I, I, my, my fishing happens over here at, at the grocery store usually but we get it backwards don't we so often we start hitting the concept of behavior modification we first start talking about all the things they're doing wrong and how they need to stop this and you got to switch this around and you got to do this that's not that's not how this fishing thing goes you don't clean a fish until you caught it. And, and, and the only way we catch it is we keep throwing the bait out there. And which means this, and we talk about this a lot, like we got to quit being so, not just, not just offended, but so surprised when people that are far from God act like they're far from God. If, if, if they don't have Jesus, what do you expect from them? What do we expect from them? Without Jesus, who would you be? In fact, go back. Without Jesus, before you found Jesus, maybe you remember, maybe you were you know, a young adult or maybe adult life when you finally got saved and just fully surrendered. Who were you before Jesus? Like I look at those seasons of my life and I got news for you. I don't like that guy. I don't like that guy that was self-serving. I don't like that guy that was self-promoting, that was, that was so focused on, on my own pleasures, that I hurt people around me, and, and, I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and sin was ruling my life. I don't like that guy, but I can't expect anything different because that guy didn't have Jesus. Sinners saved by grace, then it changes. Then it all begins to transform. And we're trying to get people cleaned up so then we can catch them. When we go to where they are, when we get out of the barrel and we go, then we begin to love them right where they are. Listen, loving them doesn't mean you agree. And you don't have to agree to love. The church has got a little scared of that, I think. I think, I think, I think the church, the big C church, I think we're a little, little hesitant. Like, well, if I get out there and I respect them and I'm kind and I'm gentle, which are all fruits of the Spirit, by the way, if I go out there and do all those things and I even engage, and if I go have lunch with them, well, that means I'm accepting their life. No, it doesn't. It means you're acknowledging that they're a person that's lost, that just needs Jesus. I think the words that we've read, even, you know, kids in Sunday school know this story, the story of Zacchaeus, but the power of these words is important. So the story of Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus is a chief tax collector, he's a little short guy, he climbs the tree, Jesus sees him. Listen to these words. When Jesus came by, Luke 19, when Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down, I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy, but the people were displeased. 
He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. A notorious sinner. See, the words when Jesus did this culturally, this is a very powerful statement, very different than if you or I just go out to lunch together. Like if you invite me to your home or I invite you to my home or we go out to eat somewhere, I mean, very nice time, maybe beginning to get to know each other better, but, but that's it. But in this culture, what that meant is that who you are, I am publicly saying, I accept you. Did Jesus accept that Zacchaeus was a thief? No. Was Jesus saying he accepts the way that, uh, that all the people around really wanted to piece of Zacchaeus because he had robbed them blind for years by overtaxing them? No, he wasn't accepting that. What he was doing is saying this, is that as a person, a sinner, someone that is in need of being saved, I accept you. I accept you first. Now let's go have a meal and talk because the cleaning happened later that day. It was after the meal that Zacchaeus says, you know what? I'm done. I'm going to pay back everything and then some. Because Jesus changes everything. Then another thing I've noticed, last one here, is this. Fishermen seem to catch more than a fisherman. You with me? Fishermen seem to catch more than a fisherman. Which means this, like, sometimes it's, it's better together. I don't, I don't know how much time you ever spend on the coast, but uh, we vacation, we love the beach. And so anytime we have a chance, and we spend a fair bit of time down uh, in the Gulf Shores, Alabama area. And there is a pier there that is a, a, just an awesome, it's one of those big long ones, it was way out there. And, and, and when you walk that pier, I'll tell you what you, you see there, is you see that on both sides, it's just lined with guys fishing. Men and women just fishing and poles everywhere and all this. But it's not just silence, okay? It, it's not a quiet place. People aren't just like, shh, shh, we're fishing. No, what you have is you have these guys and they're fishing and they're talking and they're sharing bait concepts and, oh, this is what I'm doing. And when someone catches something, they all gather around. They get excited when, they, when someone catches it. They're like, yeah, and they're sharing stories. Something about being with other fishermen makes you almost want to be a fisherman. I walk through there. I'm like, man, I could do this if it didn't involve the fishing part. <laughs> Can I just hang with you guys and hear stories? This is so cool. I mean, can you go fishing alone? Yes, I know you can. I know some of you are like, it's so relaxing. But in this idea, understand that there's something about being together. I think that's what's being said in Hebrews 10. We read this, verse 23. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his returning is drawing near. Well, you know what that means? That means this. We need to be around other fishermen too. And we need to be excited when we hear amazing stories. We need to be excited when someone comes to you and be like, man, I had this great conversation. I had a chance to pray with a coworker. I had a neighbor come over and I just got to do something kind for them. Those are the stories we need to be swapping. Because fishermen, they love being with other fishermen. So at the end of the day, how far are you from being a fisher of men? Like I told you at the beginning, I'll, I'll never be a, a, a fisherman because I, it's not a passion. It's not what I'm about. How far are you from this being what you're about? Are you too busy being the professional to let the master take control? Are you, are you hoping that while you go about your business, it might just happen? See, I think a lot of people, in fact, I think most of us here would agree, like, okay, yes, this is a good thing. Being a fisherman, getting people saved, yes, that's what we're supposed to do. But is that how we live our life? Do we live our life if that's the intent, that's my focus, or is it something we just hope happens? I mean, I, I don't think I've ever seen this happen, but, but uh, I mean, how many times have you walked beside the waterfront or down a river and fish just jump out at you? It doesn't just happen. Yeah, go fishing. So I want you to bow your heads with me this morning. And I know maybe not everybody's ready for it. And I say this okay, but I'm not saying, I don't think it's okay, but it is what it is. But for those that have Jesus in our lives, can I tell you this? 
Jesus didn't ask him. He's not asking. He's, he's commanding. Go. Go. Do this. Now the choice is yours. Now if you're here today and you're, or you're watching online and maybe you, maybe you can't be a fisherman because you haven't been caught yet. Well, here's the cool thing. Jesus has been fishing for you for a long time. He's been anxiously awaiting for you to, to take the bait and to cry to him and just simply say, Jesus, I need you in my life. I need you to forgive me. I'm tired of this old me. I'm tired of my old agendas and my selfishness. I'm tired of the way I'm hurting people and hurting myself. I, I, I want something different. I, I need you. That is the starting point of a salvation that changes everything. That invites an inconvenient Jesus into your life. So Father, I pray that you challenge us each. What are we about? And maybe there's some of us here that we're ready to say, okay, I choose. I choose to fish for men and to stop fishing for all this other stuff. And if there's someone here live or watching that's asked you in their life today, man, we celebrate that. What an amazing day it is. Anytime someone gets saved, I pray that they begin to feel that change happen from the inside out. They begin to recognize that something is different because you change everything. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with us?
So before you get out of here, a couple, couple quick things. One, uh, if you're live or online and you prayed that prayer for the first time today, I would love to follow up with you. Uh, online, there's a, there's a thing on our homepage that says, I just asked Jesus into my life now. What? Click that. It's a way for us to communicate. If you're here on the prayer card, give me your contact info. There's a little place that I asked Jesus in my life. Put it in the return box on your way out. Uh, I'd love to con- you know, connect with you this week. It's a big, big deal. Second thing is this, is that uh, my memory is not so good. My wife will attest to that. And so sometimes I need little memory things, little things to help me remember. So on your way out, on the return table, on that little table on your way out, there is a basket. And in that basket are a bunch of little plastic fish. So if that was kind of a shift you made, you'd be like, you know what? I'm going to be about this. I invite you to do this. Take a fish with you. And I want you to put it someplace where you're going to see it every day. Like this is going to go on my dash. Because I need Jesus when I drive more than any other time. <laughs> other people need Jesus when I drive. But I want you to put someplace you're going to see it every day to remember what you're about. That although there's other things you're doing in your day, this is what we're doing with our life. We're fishing. So take one of those, put it where you are. And, and here's the deal. I, I don't think you're ever done fishing. I think, I think you fish until you breathe your last. Like any good old fisherman will tell you. So grab one of those on your way out. We love you. We're praying for you. I can't wait to hear the stories. We get to stand around and swap stories of some good fishing stuff. We love it. You're out.